and it looks like they've stopped uh, filing in at the moment. We've got quite a lot of people on online. So look, welcome everyone to uh, this podcast. Uh, this is I've done plenty of Zoom meetings with the support groups, but this is actually the first of the podcasts that we've done. And it's really been a tough time for everyone with the COVID and uh, from PCFA's point of view, we're just trying to stay in contact with, with everyone and make sure that we are supporting each other and through our support groups and everyone else staying in touch as best we can. There's been a lot of interest um, in the PSMA trial and it's fantastic that we've got Professor Michael Hoffman and Pro Professor Declan Murphy with us live on this podcast and um, they'll give us a, a, a full rundown of the of the study and the, the trial and how things are, are going and I know there's a lot of people out there who are very interested in this uh, exciting new trial and um, if you have a look on your screen if you're down the bottom you'll see Q&A if you click on that um, it brings up the question box and uh, I know both both the professors are very keen for questions and uh, I know people have submitted questions beforehand and uh, they've got copies of those so they'll address those during their, their presentations as well but um, we're hoping to have quite a bit of time for Q&A at the end of the presentation so uh, please feel free to uh, click on the Q&As and uh, ask away and we'll do our very best to answer the questions so look I think that's enough from me as an intro I'll wrap up at the end but uh, to Declan and Michael thank you so much I know both of you are very busy um, this is a fantastic opportunity opportunity for our support group. So I'll hand it over to you guys and uh, look forward to what you uh, have to, to present today. Thank you, Jim, and uh, thank you, Chris, for setting all this up. Um, and honestly, it's a, it's a great privilege to be allowed to speak to the support groups. Uh, we always love when we get an opportunity to speak to our patients or other people's patients or even future patients. And uh, uh, we don't often get that chance nowadays uh, to get to connect with everybody. So we're very grateful to PCFA for putting on this uh, webinar today. Uh, I'm at home uh, in the home office. Um, and my wife is here all the time, uh, but um, I offered to pick up my laptop and go down to the playroom and fight down there with the Lego and the Nerf guns. Uh, but she said the PCFA are more important than the Stroke Foundation, uh, at least for this next hour of, uh, of my life. So I got her a nice office instead. Um, and so uh, we're going to do um, uh, two um, uh, presentations uh, uh, this afternoon, two quick presentations, but we very much encourage you to uh, get in touch using the Q&A feature and send us some questions uh, about you know, this trial or anything to do with prostate cancer, really, we're very happy uh, to speak to. So as Jim mentioned, um, uh, we, we want to speak about the trial in particular, uh, uh, PSMA PET-CT to open the discussion about this novel imaging and how I think Australia has led the way. Uh, and then Michael's gonna speak a bit about not just how we use this to diagnose patients, but also a bit about the exciting um, therapies, the treatments that PSMA uh, offer us as well. Um, and so I still like to show these nice pictures of uh, Peter Mack, uh, Peter McCallum Cancer Center. I know many of you know this building and I know many of our patients um, are online. Um, so uh, please do uh, come and visit us if you're passing through in the future, once the madness settles. Uh, we love having uh, visitors in the building, uh, whether you're patients or just wanna come and uh, have a look around the place, uh, please do come and say hello. And we'd like to, of course, especially acknowledge PCFA for their role in, in enabling this trial. Um, it was back in 2015, I think, um, uh, when Michael, uh, applied for the grant that enabled this trial, and it was a bit of a risky grant. It was far from clear whether this would be a successful uh, trial at that time, but PCFA, uh, supported by funding from Movember and through the expert um, advisory group, the expert scientific panel, who were judging uh, the uh, applications for funding for this trial, um, uh, took a punt uh, on this trial, and the results that we're going to show you today uh, are because uh, of that risk, that investment that PCFA uh, put into the team led by Michael. Um, so thank you uh, to PCFA uh, and thank you to uh, you out there, um, uh, the supporters of PCFA. Uh, I know you're out there uh, all the time advocating for PCFA, uh, raising money for PCFA um, and uh, advocating for the cause of prostate cancer patients in Australia. So we're very grateful to you. And I know that there are patients uh, out there who participated in the trial, in the pro-PSMA trial that I'm about to show to you and a very special thanks to you all for uh, becoming a part of this trial. Uh, this is myself and Michael uh, a few weeks ago at Peter Mac opening um, a new uh, center of excellence, a, a seven and a half million dollar center of excellence into PSMA imaging and therapy. So we're still very, very interested in 
pushing beyond what we're showing you today uh, because we think there's a lot more in this conversation about how we can use advanced imaging uh, to drive better uh, results for our patients. Um, and our philosophy uh, at Peter Mac is very much multidisciplinary, uh, you won't be surprised to hear. Um, but what we've done uh, in the past uh, five years is really embed nuclear medicine, uh, people like Michael and his colleagues, into our multidisciplinary team. And we've written papers about this, as you can see here. And this is our multidisciplinary team meeting at Peter Mac. Uh, it happens every Thursday morning, uh, early in the morning. It used to be in real life in this beautiful room we have. Uh, now it's all on Zoom, of course. Um, uh, but we will be back in this room, I'm sure, before too long. We still keep, of course, the multidisciplinary uh, philosophy uh, through Zoom. You can still do that, sharing all these important images for our complex prostate cancer patients. I want to, first of all, um, remind you about the sort of patients that we were interested in studying uh, in this trial. Uh, and here's another great initiative from um, Movember. This is the PCOR. Uh, registry, the Prostate Cancer Outcomes Registry across Australia and New Zealand. And they now publish this report every year, which gives us an amazing snapshot into the current state of prostate cancer in Australia. So broadly speaking, we diagnose men either as having localized prostate cancer, so it's confined to the prostate or so we think, uh, or metastatic advanced prostate cancer. And about 90% of all prostate cancers nowadays are localized to the prostate. But within that, we can describe them as low, intermediate, or high risk. And that's all about the risk of the cancer spreading, um, uh, even despite uh, what looks like successful treatment. Uh, and what we were interested in in this study is looking at men with the kind of more aggressive intermediate risk or high risk cancer, because they're the ones that we know if, you, uh, if your scans suggest that the cancer is confined to the prostate, we sometimes find within a year or two afterwards that the cancer has recurred or in fact was probably outside the prostate already, we just couldn't see it uh, with the traditional scans we type to use. So this is an important group of patients because we know that traditional scanning um, uh, doesn't do well in, in this group of patients. And that's the reality is that despite what looks like successful treatment, surgery or radiation therapy, 40 or 50% will get a recurrence. So PSMA PET-CT came along a few years ago, um, I think it was 2000 and 14, when Michael and colleagues did their first scans at Peter Mac uh, and showed great promise um, in two groups of our prostate cancer patients. The first were those who'd already had treatment, but the PSA came back. And I know many of you are familiar with that situation, but we couldn't see where the, the cancer was because traditional scans don't work very well. So this molecule called PSMA, prostate specific membrane antigen, um, sits uh, in various parts of the body. Actually, this is a, a normal scan as Michael is showing us here. And you can actually see the PSMA gathers in the, in the parotid glands. You can see it in the kidneys and then a bit in the small bowel and it gets, goes out in the urine. So any of us will have a scan that looks like this. But if you have aggressive prostate cancer and especially if it's very aggressive prostate cancer or recurrent and so on, you'll see PSMA uh, very, very active um, in many of these uh, regions. And you'll see it uh, long before you would see it on a traditional scan. So here's an example, a patient of mine, I remember he had very high risk prostate cancer when I operated on him in 2011 uh, at Peter Mac. His initial PSA was about 60. Um, and he did well initially, his PSA disappeared, but then it started uh, coming back. Um, and he had all sorts of scans done as his PSA was rising up and we could never see the cancer, but he was getting more and more anxious. He had whole body MRI scans, coline PET CT scans. And then we did a PSMA PET CT on him. He was one of the first patients we scanned. And what you see here is as we've shown you, you know, the cancer is in the, the kidney or the, the PSMA is evident in the kidneys. That's normal, we expect that. But all these dots you see here uh, in the abdomen are lymph nodes that we couldn't see on the conventional scan. And up here uh, in his clavicle, near his left clavicle, uh, he's got prostate cancer there as well. So in this one shot scan, you see the whole picture and you see it with great clarity. That's a little lymph node there just above his left clavicle. And uh, you'd never see that on the conventional scan that you see here, but when you turn on the PSMA, there she blows. Uh, and in the early days, you know, we weren't convinced that this was truly cancer. So we went and biopsied many of these. This is an ultrasound guided biopsy of the lymph node. Yes, and lo and behold, you have high-grade high prostate cancer there. So that was very impressive in men who'd had treatment already, but there's a suspicion of recurrence. Um, and we know that PSMA really performs well there. And myself and Michael and our collaborators have published a lot of papers, uh, very highly cited papers, summarizing that data. So we know that's a group of patients of interest. 
But what about primary staging? What about the newly diagnosed patients, like I just showed you from the Movember registry, the ones especially that were worried that traditional scans are underestimating or not showing us the correct extent of disease. So the ProPSMA trial was uh, an effort to, uh, in a prospective randomized fashion, so very high quality science, determine if PSMA PET-CT would be better uh, than traditional scans. Um, and this is the, the paper uh, that Jim referred to, which was published in The Lancet, which is a very famous journal. I'm sure many of you know that, um, based in the UK, and it takes uh, only the highest quality um, uh, clinical trials and science from around the world of all, all types of medical specialties. So you're competing, you know, with breast cancer and cardiology and uh, brain tumors and, and pediatrics and so on when you're trying to get your paper uh, into the Lancet. Um, uh, but Michael, you can see first author here and our team um, uh, from all over Australia um, wrote this paper based on the results and got it accepted by the Lancet, which means that the scientific community recognized this is a, a practice changing um, study. So what I'm going to do for the next uh, five or six minutes or so is summarize what we found uh, in that study and try and let you um, see why it's important for our patients, for many of you out there even. Um, and these slides are what um, the slides that Michael prepared uh, to present uh, this data to the world. He's a genius at PowerPoint, by the way. He creates these beautiful animations, as you can see here, and he's a very popular speaker as a result, so thank you, Michael. And what he's illustrating here is the tremendous team that came together uh, in this trial. It was a a multi-center trial, 10 sites from around Australia, led from Peter Mac. And you can see it, it's a combination of nuclear medicine physicians, urologists, radiation oncologists, and all the sort of team that support that, including uh, our, all our allied health and nurses and so on. And of course, as I said at the outset, the patients who support it. So a very, a very um, uh, well-credentialed group of collaborators. And the background, the premise, I suppose, is exactly as I've said to you, that you know, in these high-risk prostate cancers, we, we get relapse. Um, and we want to see whether we, if we scan the patients with a better quality scan in the first place, we might have better information for defining uh, the extent of the disease. And there are lots of reasons why we might have thought it's attractive. You know, it's a one-stop scan. You just come for one scan, not for a CT scan and come back for a bone scan that takes a few hours. Striking contrast. You can see these cancers um, as, uh, are very vivid, as I showed you a moment ago. And really, in Australia, unlike many other countries, this scan has become very widely uh, available. And, and that's part of the, the uh, rationale for running the trial in Australia is we have much more expertise here than, for example, in the United States, where this is a, a much less experience using this type of scan. So here's the, the trial design. These were men who'd just been diagnosed with what looked like nasty prostate cancer, um, but we were intending to uh, treat them with curative intent. So basically, they've had a, maybe an MRI and a biopsy. Uh, and the biopsy shows that they have um, high-grade cancer, you know, Gleason, seven, uh, Gleason 8, 9, 10, or Gleason 4 plus 3 in the old money, which I know many of you are familiar with. And nowadays, we call that the grade grouping, grade group 3, 4, 5. And we recruited 300 men from around Australia. And so they've just been diagnosed, and they're about to have their first scans. And the trial meant that they were randomized to either get a conventional scans, CT and bone scan, or a PET scan. Um, and that was the initial intent of the study. Um, and this is the sort of patients that we were enrolling, typically 68 years of age, high PSA readings, you know, 16 or 17, uh, and the great group, uh, uh, 3, 4, 5, in other words, Gleason, uh, 4 plus 3 or higher, uh, so nasty looking, uh, higher chance of spreading. Um, and then what happened was, uh, presuming that the scan didn't show extensive metastases uh, spread beyond the prostate, the patients all crossed over. So if you were randomized to get the CT and bone scan first, then you crossed over and got a PET scan and vice versa in the other arm. So the vast majority of people got both scans at the outset. So that meant you're going to be able to compare PET scan versus CT scan and see which is the better scan and so on. And then these men were followed. Many of them had treatment, of course, uh, surgery or radiotherapy. Some of them had you know, advanced cancer, so didn't have surgery or radiotherapy. But then at around the six month uh, time point, we were able to assess whether the original scans were right because you know, we had tissue taken out or lymph nodes or a chance to see whether the metastases were really evident on further scans. And at each time point, uh, we were measuring uh, the impact of the scan. So we would ask the clinicians to say, okay, what's your plan with this patient before you have any scan? And then you might have a CT scan next and we say, okay, what's your plan now uh, based on that information? And then they have a PET scan. Okay, what's your plan now? And these management plans became very important in determining how impactful uh, the scans were uh, and so on.
I won't bore you with this, but this is how we defined uh, the final truth to say, okay, that scan was correct. The CT scan was correct or the PSMA scan was correct. This, the trial recruited very, very well. This is a recruitment curve. And, and so in, in gray is what you might expect over a few years to recruit into your trial. A lot of trials will just chundra along over here uh, and we, you might have delayed recruitment, but pro PSMA, again, testament to all the patients and all the trial sites involved, recruited very early, six months ahead of time actually had finished due to the enthusiasm of the, uh, the patients getting involved and the trial sites. And before I show you the data, I'll just show you some typical examples. And, and here's a patient, 69 year old, PSA 12, one of my patients. Uh, he had a, an MRI scan showing this abnormality. That's what the black dot is. And he had grade group five, so Gleason 9 prostate cancer. Uh, we did a PET scan first. He was randomized to PET scan first, and that's what the cancer looks like on a PET scan, that red dot you see there. Uh, and what you see here is the normal scans, the CT scans, and here's the PET scan side by side. And on the CT scan, it looks like it's confined to the prostate. There are no lymph nodes, nothing else. Whereas on the PET scan, what you see here are lymph nodes that you can never see uh, on a normal scan. And this just shows you the beauty of PSMA PET CT, and it does make a difference. It means we're, getting, we're definitely going to operate on those lymph nodes or we're going to treat them with radiation and so on. So clearly showing the superiority uh, of um, uh, PSMA PET CT. But here's another one, uh, a 46 year old who traveled interstate uh, to see us. His PSA was 14, very high for a young guy. You know, again, MRI, very abnormal, very high grade prostate cancer. And he had a PSMA PET CT first. And what you see in black here, this is the prostate cancer. So a big lump of cancer in the prostate, but he's got all these lymph nodes going high up into his abdomen. So quite advanced cancer that we wouldn't normally operate on or do radiotherapy for. And you'll see it there on that version of the scan as well. So here you have his regular CT, normal, no lymph nodes, PET scan, cancer. So we clearly see a different picture, much more accurate information. We know this is correct. We've biopsied lots of these uh, over the years. So what do we do now? He's a fit young guy. If we only looked at the scan uh, on the right of the picture, we would definitely do surgery, but he would definitely fail because he'd have radiotherapy. Or if we did radiotherapy, you know, he would definitely fail as well. So do we not do so? It's very, it creates different information and there are some clinical conundrums as a result of this. But here are the results. Here's what the trial showed, and this is why there's such excitement. It showed that when we compared them head to head, PSMA PET CT had 27% uh, greater accuracy compared to normal scanning. Uh, so that's a, a huge uh, difference. Uh, you know, we might expect PSMA to be a little bit better, but it's way better. Uh, so when we compare them, this is what you see. Uh, PSMA PET CT is 92% accurate, almost always gets the uh, information correct. Whereas a combination of a CT and a bone scan only gets it right about two thirds of the time. So this is the primary endpoint. This is the most important thing. And clearly this is very impactful. It shows you you've got a new gold standard that we should be uh, aiming for. Uh, Michael prepared, prepared these nice graphics that show in the patients who had secondaries, uh, who had advanced cancer, you can see that in, in the bones, you can see on the one-stop scan, you see it's a lot of it's down in the sacrum, but sometimes it's higher up here as well. And many of these are missed on the conventional scans. And this is really important to know if you've got cancer in these regions, because our plan should be different. Same with the lymph nodes. You know, many of them are down here, but many of them are in more tricky locations, like the one I just showed you, or up here uh, in, the, in the clavicles, a classic area to get lymph nodes. And the other things we looked at, apart from the accuracy of the scan, is what was the impact, the change in management, as I mentioned earlier. And you can see with PSMA, it's very impactful. So when we have a PET scan compared to a bone scan, uh, we change the management 28% of the time versus only 15% of the time uh, with CT and a bone scan. And it's the same when we swap over uh, to the other imaging. So you put a CT scan first, and then you go and have a PET scan. It still changes your mind, even though you've already had a scan to give you information. You cross over and have the PET scan, it was still just as important, 27% of the time uh, changing the plan. And another important thing that some of you will be unfortunately familiar with is that equivocal studies are a reality in prostate cancer. If you just have a CT and a bone scan, 23% of the time you get a result, a report that says uncertainty, you know, there's the equivocal bone thing. And then we have to go and do a PET scan or an, M an MRI scan or a biopsy. And that happens, you know, one in four of our patients come back with a report, we're not sure. More stress and anxiety, you gotta go and have more scans. Whereas with PSMA PET CT, that, that really rarely happened. You get definite information that is very confident. And also another important matter is the radiation dose. Much less radiation if you just have a PET scan compared to if you have a combination of a CT and a bone scan. 
And also we know that when we uh, had these scans assessed by different uh, um, radiologists and nuclear medicine experts, they agreed nearly all the time. Uh, so we can train people to a very high level. So we know that you, you know, you're gonna have an accurate reading from your interpreter. So the discussions about this, I mean, this is a lot of strengths in this study. That's why it's in the Lancet. That's why it's a lot of media coverage, even with all the COVID stuff going on. Multi-center, randomized, et cetera, direct comparison. These are all very strong things. We have to acknowledge no study is perfect. There are some weaknesses. And I think the main thing we talk about is whether the change in management, the fact you see that lymph node that you never saw before, whether the fact that you change the plan because you see it on the PET scan will actually turn into a better cancer outcome for our patients. And in prostate cancer, you need many years to determine if the change of decision at this point is gonna make a difference down the line. So Propius and A, uh, was, we'll never be able to answer that question with short follow-up, but we certainly consider that it, it may well do in the future. And we definitely believe that if you have this accurate information, you will do better for your patients. Uh, and Michael and his team prepared this nice infographic, which got circulated widely on social media that summarizes uh, everything I've just said to you. Randomized trial, much better accuracy, much better management impact, fewer uncertain results, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So my take home messages to you on this is this trial, thank you PCFA and all of you out there who helped with it, uh, has established the superiority of PSMA uh, for primary staging everywhere in the world. One stop scan, very cost effective. We have a health economics paper coming, uh, part of the trial which will support that. Uh, but the caveat being, will this really help uh, our patients? I'm sure it will, that's what I believe. And now the next challenge, uh, reimbursement, uh, because I know many of you out there have probably paid for your own PSMA PET CT, and, and these are expensive scans, anywhere between uh, $600 and $1,000, uh, depending on, on where you are. Uh, but I'm pleased to tell you that uh, we're already well down a pathway uh, with um, uh, MSAC uh, to get PSMA PET CT reimbursed, certainly in the primary staging setting, and we think hopefully in the biochemical staging setting. Uh, and in fact, I've got a, I'm, I'm in the midst of many weeks of meetings about this, um, and uh, I believe our application uh, will be successful, uh, certainly for the pro PSMA type of patient, which will be great uh, for patients all around the place. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my slide and uh, hand over to uh, my illustrious colleague, uh, Michael Hoffman, nuclear medicine physician at Peter Mac. Michael. I better unmute myself, that'll help. Um, uh, thanks, Declan. Uh, yeah, so I have the pleasure of talking to you about the therapeutic side of things. The great thing about PSMA is it's not just used for imaging, but also for a therapy. So this is a field called theranostics, and the theranostics has two components to it, the thera, which is the therapy, and the gnostics, which is the diagnostics. So Declan's really highlighted very nicely how we can use PSMA uh, for imaging prostate cancer on a PET scanner. So for that, we're using radioactive substances like gallium-68, which have a low energy. The radiation passes out of the body and we get these beautiful three-dimensional images. But that sort of radioactive tracer has absolutely no effect on the body whatsoever. After, for treatment, we take the same molecule and we just change the type of radioactive label. And the radiation we're using is a molecule called lutetium-177. And lutetium, uh, travels a very short distance, only about one millimeter, and deposits really high doses of radiation within that one millimeter sphere. So it's really quite a neat way to deliver very high doses of radiation to kill tumor cells wherever they happen to be uh, in a very targeted fashion. So on the right here, we see a patient uh, with a very extensive prostate cancer throughout the bones, also involving the adrenal glands and the lungs and very intense uptake of the PSMA, uh, suggesting that you know, this man might benefit from lutetium PSMA therapy. And on the left, we get some blurry image. We can actually image the lutetium using a different type of technology called SPECT rather than PET. And this is what a SPECT scan looks like of exactly the same uh, person a few days after the uh, PET scan. And the neat thing about lutetium is that one millimeter path length that I alluded to. And that means that within a tumor tissue that might be one centimeter in size, there's really good delivery of radiation. And even if not every cell in that tumor specimen expresses the PSMA, it'll still get a really high dose of radiation. This is different than some of the targeted drugs in oncology. There's a whole bunch of really very targeted drugs 
But if nearby cells don't express that target, they tend to rapidly grow up in resistance. Uh, so in effect, we see with radioactive treatments within a given tumor specimen, you know, there may be less of this resistance building up. Uh, this is, you know, we've had a big Theranostics program at Peter Mac, not from prostate cancer actually, but we were treating a range of rare tumors called neuroendocrine tumors that we treated with uh, lutetium labeled to a different radioactive molecule. And this is a program that's been growing over the last 15 years. And back in 2015, we were able to be the first center in Australia to give uh, lutetium PSMA because the technology used for labeling these radioactive substances and the infrastructure you need to give it is really very uh, as similar. So you can see you know, a couple of years ago, we performed almost 500 lutetium therapies uh, in that year at Peter Mac. It actually, it's probably the second largest center in the world uh, using lutetium 177. And uh, you know, th this work was pioneered by the Germans back in 2015. They produced uh, this manuscript uh, where they showed this image of a patient with prostate cancer. And you can see a few sites of tumors in, in black. These aren't all prostate cancer. This is normal kidneys and normal salivary glands. But these black spots that I've drawn circles around are sites of tumors. And after two cycles of therapy, uh, we see a complete response with no tumor present. Uh, this early data from Germany led us at Peter Mac to conduct at that time a small 30 patient trial, but it was the first clinical trial of this therapy anywhere in the world that was done sort of prospectively. And it was published in Lancet Oncology, one of our big journals back in uh, 2018. And what we looked at in this 30 patient study that was subsequently expanded to 50 patients was the uh, PSA response. So in blue, a men who had a drop in their PSA of 50% or more, and each one of these bars is one of these 50 patients. So 64% of these men had a drop of 50% or more. And that's quite remarkable because these were men who had progressed after really all standard therapies. They'd had docetaxel, enzalutamide, abiraterone. Half the group had actually had carbazitaxel as well. Uh, so these were men who ordinarily probably would have gone to palliative care, yet they had this treatment and... Uh, we saw some remarkable responses. And this is one of the images from that study. These are the eight best responders out of the 50 men in this study and the PSMA PET scans before and after with the computer highlighting the prostate cancer in red. And we can see just how nicely PSMA PET uh, demonstrates the distribution of disease and which can be a bit scary at baseline, uh, but also how nicely it enables us to, to assess response. And, you know, this slide, it's a little bit misleading because these are the eight best responders out of the 50 and not all 50 men responded like this. In fact, you know, these are, these are the best responders. And here's one of these uh, best responders. Uh, this is a man who's had this large lymph node in the abdomen that was growing very quickly and actually causing severe back pain. And uh, it was lining up very brightly on the PSMA PET. And we also do a FDG PET scan that I'll talk about in a few minutes. And uh, we can see that it's lighting up brightly on both scans. And when we treated him with lutetium, we can actually get a measure of how much radiation we're able to deliver. And we're able to deliver 170 gray uh, to this lymph node, which is a really high amount of radiation. And we can see this is a graph of his PSA over time. And PSA was rising very quickly before lutetium and then falling very quickly with lutetium. And in fact, after three doses of lutetium, the PSA actually became undetectable, it fell to zero. Uh, and it stayed there for around 18 months. But then PSA started rising again, and we gave some more lutetium and PSA fell. And you can see he's continued to respond to each cycle of lutetium, uh, although perhaps the duration of response is shorter than it was to start with. Uh, so at some point, this treatment will stop working. Uh, but this is someone who's very, very sensitive to this tube, to this type of therapy. You know, this is actually quite an unusual response in terms of it's, it's an exceptional response. Uh, this is probably actually one of the you know, top five best responders that we've treated at Peter Mac, but we've now got four years follow-up and PSA has almost come back down to zero after the ninth treatment with lutetium. So there's certainly a small group of men that behave like this who just have the most incredible responses to this type of uh, treatment. It's important to note that we don't treat everyone. We do select patients very carefully, at least at Peter Mac and in our clinical trials. Uh, so this is uh, a man with very extensive bony metastases and uh, the intensity of uptake on the PSMA PET is actually very high. We can measure that using a parameter called SUV max and 70 is a very high number. 
telling us that the very intense uptake. So you may look at this scan and go, highly suitable for PSMA treatment. We do another type of scan in all these men, which is an FDG PET scan. An FDG is a type of radioactive sugar and it measures something different. And what we can see in this uh, patient is that there are lots of tumors in the liver. This is the liver here. And there's lots of tumors scattered throughout the liver that have actually quite low uptake on the PSMA PET scan. So they've lost that PSMA receptor. And we can color code this so that in red is disease that we can not target, that we predict up front that we can't target with lutetium PSMA because it's not lighting up on our PSMA PET scans. And you can probably estimate that around, you know, a fifth of the disease in this patient can't be targeted with lutetium PSMA. And paradoxically, that's the tumors that are growing most rapidly because they're using sugar and tumors use sugar to grow. Uh, so we often usually direct these men to other forms of therapy like more chemotherapy or other trials that we might have available because in our experience, you know, these men are going to fail at PSMA therapy. Now that 50 patient study at Peter Mac led us to uh, conduct this Australia wide trial uh, called the therapy trial, another trial, you know, put together by the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia. So you just saw, saw the pro PSMA trial uh, from Declan and uh, uh, this is another PCFA trial. And when you think about it, the pro PSMA trial and the therapy trial are two sort of first in class clinical trials in the world with PSMA, one on the imaging side and one on the therapy side. So these evolved, you know, four to five years ago, back in 2015, and it's taken a while to get the results through. Uh, so we really do thank the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia for investing in this new type of technology, because back in 2015, let me tell you, most of the world had not heard of PSMA, even the likes of urologists like Declan around the world had not heard of PSMA. So this was a high risk sort of study to be undertaking uh, back there. Oh, this trial also had funding from uh, Movember Endocyte, who's our industry partner, Ansto, where we get our lutetium from, and ANZUP, who are a cooperative uh, clinical trials group, uh, and another network called the Australian Radiopharmaceuticals Trials Network, uh, which are a group of nuclear medicine specialists that put together these trials. And this is a randomized trial comparing lutetium PSMA to carbazitaxel, which is a type of chemotherapy similar to docetaxel uh, in men with uh, metastatic uh, castration resistant prostate cancer. And this was really a big team effort. These are the key investigators uh, at all 11 sites around Australia. This was a really great partnership. We had medical oncologists working very closely with our nuclear medicine doctors uh, at all these sites together with the clinical trials uh, specialists that are good at collecting all the data. And uh, the, this is the trial design. I won't go into it in any length, but patients were randomized, which means essentially the computer flipped a coin and half the men had lutetium and half the men had chemotherapy. Like the uh, graph Declan showed for the pro PSMA study, this trial recruited very quickly. We were able to do 200 patients and we completed the study around six months ahead of schedule. And this is uh, not usual. Most clinical trials run uh, behind schedule. Uh, so this was just you know, a great team effort from all the people involved. And uh, I had the pleasure of recently presenting the results at the ASCO meeting. This is the American Society of Clinical Oncology. It's a huge oncology meeting, usually attended by around 60,000 oncology professionals. It's in Chicago every year because Chicago is the only conference center in the US that's large enough to host this Congress. Obviously, this year it was changed to a, a virtual meeting. Actually, that conference center, much like the exhibition center in Melbourne, was turned into a makeshift hospital to look after uh, our COVID-19 uh, patients. And, and this was the primary endpoint of the study. So these are again, two waterfall plots. So in each of these graphs, each bar represents the best drop in PSA. Uh, in each of the roughly 100 men in each arm, because there was 200 men in total. And we defined a good response as a drop in PSA of 50% or more. And 66% of the men who received lutetium uh, had a drop of more than 50% compared to only 37% of men who received the carbazitaxel. Uh, so that uh, is a 29% absolute greater response rate in the lutetium arm compared to the carbazitaxel arm. So this is you know, not a small difference, but quite a big difference between, between the two arms, very encouraging results. And we were also able to look at the side effects uh, 
between men who received chemotherapy compared to lutetium PSMA. And uh, these are, this is the main figure of interest. 35% of men having lutetium had uh, you know, significant side effects. This may be due to the drug, the lutetium, but it could also be due to just progressive prostate cancer uh, compared to 54% of men who received the chemotherapy. So more side effects with chemotherapy. And we can see things like neuropathy with chemotherapy, which really didn't occur with lutetium or diarrhea with chemotherapy and neutropenia with chemotherapy. Now, the main side effect of the lutetium PSMA is dry mouth and uh, dry eyes that we saw in 60% uh, and 30% of men. And this is usually a pretty mild side effect. Men say, I've got a bit of a dry mouth, but it's not, you know, not particularly bothering me if it's bad. Uh, sometimes diet has to be changed and uh, there are some you know, low level interventions like some artificial saliva that, that can be used. Uh, in, in this study, there were no lutetium uh, PSMA related deaths, uh, which is good. This is a really, it's a well tolerated treatment. It's a really targeted treatment. And most men that come to me for this therapy, you know, really say that it's well tolerated compared to chemotherapy treatment that they may have had in the past. So the conclusion of this study really hot off the press only presented a few weeks ago uh, concluded that in men with progressive disease after docetaxel chemotherapy that lutetium PSMA was more active than the carbazitaxel chemotherapy uh, with fewer severe side effects and a uh, PFS which is a progression free survival favoring lutetium PSMA and we're continuing to follow up the men in this trial this was the first analysis and uh, we're going to we're about to embark on the second planned analysis uh, where we'll look at other things like quality of life and uh, overall uh, survival. Uh, so this was really a, a quite a big study, uh, thanks to the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia for, for really putting it together, funding it, and uh, all the uh, collaborators that I already mentioned. There's another big international trial underway. This trial is not running in Australia. It's a study called the VISION trial. This is a big, actually 815 patient trial uh, which was running mainly in the USA and Europe. Uh, different trial designs, similar group of men, but ran randomized to lutetium or what they called best supportive, best standard of care, which was essentially no therapy at all. And they're trying to show that the lutetium improves overall survival. And this is an industry sponsored uh, trial designed to get uh, this new therapy approved by the FDA in the USA, and then hopefully reimbursed and and widely available uh, globally. The results of this trial are not uh, yet available and I don't think we'll see the results until uh, early next year. And we do have a variety of other trials open at Peter Mac and at other sites around Australia. I won't go into them in any detail, but these are actually six trials. And we have a trial combining lutetium with uh, immunotherapy called the PRINCE trial, uh, led by Shanine Sandu, who's one of our oncologists and myself, uh, funded through the Victorian Cancer Agency. We have a trial combining lutetium PSMA with a drug called a, a PARP inhibitor. This is a drug that we hope will enhance the effects of the radiation. Uh, a drug combining lutetium PSMA with uh, enzalutamide, a big randomized trial run by uh, Louise Emmett, uh, someone we collaborate closely with, another nuclear medicine specialist in, in Sydney, funded by uh, Movember, uh, just about to commence soon. And at Peter Mac, uh, we're also leading the upfront PSMA trial. This is a trial that's unique because these trials are all in the castrate resistant population, but upfront, as the name might imply, is in men with castrate sensitive uh, prostate cancer. And we are randomizing men to either lutetium followed by docetaxel or chemotherapy alone. And this is uh, going to be running at all those 11 sites uh, around Australia. And we've commenced this study at Peter Mac and uh, we're seeing all the other sites around Australia coming online. And Declan's leading a study called the lutectomy study, where we're bringing it actually to a first line treatment and men with high risk localized prostate cancer are having one or two doses of lutetium PSMA and then proceeding to their prostatectomy. And uh, we're going to have a look and see how much damage we can cause to the prostate cancer because Declan will be taking out the prostate and we'll be able to look at the pathology and see uh, how much of the cancer we can kill uh, with lutetium. Uh, so these trials, all you know, led by PCFA and, and, and really led Australia leading the world, has generated quite a bit of interest in the, in the lay uh, press, which we're pleased with. This is uh, Barry Elderfield, one of our patients who had lutetium PSMA, who's been a great uh, patient uh, advocate and leading the world uh, 
uh, know about this treatment. And uh, this is a sort of a, a plot of all the trials that we have uh, up and running in the PSMA space, both diagnostic imaging and the therapy side of things at Peter Mac. Uh, you know, big, uh, quite a big program. Uh, we have uh, almost $30 million of combined uh, funding to run all these trials. And most recently we've established what we've called the Prostate Theranostics and Imaging Center of Excellence or PROSTIC for short at Peter Mac. This is actually uh, thanks to a large uh, donation from the US-based uh, Prostate Cancer Foundation uh, to put this together. And uh, we have uh, three big aims. And the first aim is to grow our portfolio of clinical trials uh, because we think clinical trials is really important. We think developing the high level evidence in these trials are what our governments need in order to make this therapy widely available and you know, free and reimbursed uh, for men right around Australia, but also right around the world. So currently we have about five trials open in the therapy space. We want to expand that with this money to a portfolio of around 10 clinical trials. And we're going to do some discovery research to find the next generation of new molecules and also provide some education and leadership to let other groups around the world uh, know how we give this therapy and how to best uh, optimize uh, this treatment. Uh, many partners uh, among multiple disciplines and funding partners, so I won't go through them all, but really lots of people to, to thank and leave you with a picture of the uh, GU oncology team at Peter Mac led by uh, Declan in the top right, the nuclear medicine team uh, at Peter Mac and the uh, basic laboratory team in the top right at Peter Mac. And now I will stop talking and stop sharing my screen and uh, open it up for some interactive questions and answers. Thank you very much, um, Michael, for that fantastic talk. Um, uh, hello, Jim. Welcome back. We have some great questions uh, coming through. Jim, shall we just go straight into it? Yeah, look, yeah, that's fantastic. I think there's 12 or 13 questions. Go for it, um, Declan. Thanks. Um, so I will um, spin off a few myself and then I will bat a few over to um, Hoffman. Um, and uh, please keep sending your questions in. And someone else has raised a hand. That's good. Alan White, can this be used for low risk prostate cancer? Um, not really, Alan. Um, uh, as you know uh, from supporting the Navigate trial, uh, the vast majority of our men with low risk prostate cancer um, uh, don't need any treatment at all. So we we don't tend to use PSMA to look for a disease outside the prostate in those men. Uh, although we have a trial running uh, at Peter Mac and in Sydney called the primary trial, which we do uh, a PSMA before a biopsy. Um, and what we think in that trial is it will, you know, may help in those men whose MRI scan is not clearly showing cancer or clearly not showing cancer, sort of in between equivocal. Um, but I think if we already know you've got low risk prostate cancer, there's very little value in doing a PSMA PET unless something's really odd, you know, the PSA is really rising uh, and the biopsy is not showing us something, something definite. We, if we're still suspicious, we will do PSMA PET CT and sometimes we will find something that we might've missed on a biopsy. Uh, Michael, have you anything else to add about low risk prostate cancer? No, I think you've covered it well. Maybe I'll answer the, uh, I've picked off the, is this treatment available in Victoria question? And I might just uh, answer that one. So I think PSMA PET as a scan is now widely available. We did a first PSMA PET at Peter Mac back in 2014, but now there's more than 50 centers around Australia where you can get a PSMA PET scan, although it's not yet reimbursed. In terms of lutetium PSMA therapy, that's much less available uh, around Australia. Peter Mac remains the only center in Victoria uh, delivering this treatment. And uh, But as you've seen from the therapy study, there is a network of sites uh, that we've established mainly in large hospital-based sites uh, and there's one in every state except Tasmania uh, that can deliver lutetium PSMA therapy and there's a few uh, private providers as well who are doing uh, lutetium PSMA as a as a fee-for-service uh, type uh, uh, procedure. Uh, so it is available in Australia which is good you know in in the USA for example if you wanted to have lutetium PSMA therapy tomorrow. There is actually no mechanism. There is not a, even if you're a billionaire in the USA, you cannot access PSMA therapy at the moment. It's even hard to get a PSMA PET scan in the USA at the moment. 
So we have an unusual regulatory environment in Australia. In the US, the FDA regulates all of these radioactive traces, both diagnostics and therapeutics. And unless it's FDA approved, it's actually a criminal offence to give a unapproved drug to a patient. So if you do a PSMA PET scan in America, not in a clinical trial, you can actually be put in jail for giving an unapproved substance to a, to a patient. Uh, but that's not the case in Australia. Australia has a different regulation around these radioactive traces and they're actually exempt. So it is possible to give them even though they're not approved and reimbursed. We think that's, that's good for men, uh, but we would like to see this a, a approved and uh, reimbursed treatment in Australia. And that's what we're, we're working towards at Peter Mac by doing these trials and uh, providing the evidence so that we can go to government and say, hey, make this treatment and scans available. In fact, the pro-PSMA trial has done that because as you've seen, Declan's now you know, in a group of, with a group of uh, people who are actually involved in that process of uh, getting the government to come up with essentially an item number for a PSMA PET scan. I think it's going to take a little bit longer to get uh, lutetium PSMA uh, funded. There we're quite a bit away from that. Uh, we need to wait for the definitive results of these uh, trials. But the bottom line is, you know, the treatment is available. You know, and I think if you speak to your, you know, treating specialist, whether it's a urologist, a surgeon, a radiation oncologist, medical oncologist, uh, you know, you can be referred to ideally somewhere where you can get on possibly a clinical trial where you don't have to pay for the treatment and also generate some high level evidence at the same time. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Um, I can see Richard Miller has raised his hand. Richard, we will click the allow to talk button in a few moments if you do have a microphone and we'll let you ask your question. Uh, but we'll run through a few other questions first. Uh, Richard Flanagan wonders what percentage or number of Australian men with prostate cancer treatment are in the public hospital. Uh, yes, I can tell you, Richard, that the majority of patients in, I can give you Victorian answers, but I think it'll apply. Uh, the majority of newly diagnosed prostate cancer patients, about 68% are diagnosed in the private system. Uh, and about 75% of all radical prostatectomies are in the private system. Um, so that's probably because the age group of, of patients being diagnosed tend to be uh, men in their mid 60s, uh, many of them still have insurance and so on. So there's a disproportionately high number of prostate cancer diagnoses um, in the private system compared to, for example, other uh, surgical procedures. Um, uh, and then within the public system, what we've seen in the past few years is there's a, and I work in both systems, nearly all of us do because there's so much prostate cancer in the private system. It's important for us to have a presence there so we can uh, offer patients these types of trials. We recruit public and private patients for all these trials. Um, uh, but uh, for me, I spend about half my time in the public system, half my time in the private system, and I'm a, I do full-time prostate cancer uh, treatment. So it's about three quarters. And look, I'll make a comment about that is that sometimes people think they should be in the private system to get best care or best technologies and so on. Um, and that might be true in some respects for certain things. But I can tell you, I think for cancer treatment in Australia, generally speaking, um, especially if you're prepared to travel into some of the bigger cancer centers, you, you really get world class uh, access to great people, great technologies and so on for all cancers. Uh, and places like Peter Mac, for example, you can get everything in there, robotic surgery, high volume robot surgeons, PET scanning, et cetera, et cetera, short waiting lists. We look after patients from all over Australia, as you probably know, uh, and our waiting list for surgery is between two and three months uh, from everyone gets a robot prostatectomy um, and all the surgeons there are very high volume prostate cancer surgeons. So, you know, if you choose to be in the private system, you have certain other benefits, slightly quicker treatment and, and so on, get access to who you want. But uh, the public system really does very, very well with prostate cancer, uh, I believe, in Australia. Uh, at what PSA level, Michael, uh, is a PSMA scan accurate? I suppose you might answer for the patient who's already had treatment and now his PSA is rising. And indeed, there's a question down the bottom from um, Bert uh, Alish. Uh, Bert is wondering, uh, he's seven years after treatment for prostate cancer and his PSA has just reappeared at 0 0.01. Um, so, Michael, at what PSA level is a scan accurate? And for example, if you're seven years after treatment and your PSA has just reappeared, um, should you have a PSMA PET scan? Yeah, so this is after you've had a, your prostate taken out or maybe after radiation treatment and your PSA is rising. Look, it's very accurate at very low levels of PSA. So we see men with barely detectable PSAs who uh, we can localise the disease on the PET scan. Uh, a word of caution, though, because localizing the cancer 
then leads to a phenomenon where you want to treat what you see. Uh, and that may in some men lead to over treatment. So, you know, let's paint the picture. You have a PSA of 0.2 and this technology is not available. So you can't, you don't know where it is. The only thing you know is you might have prostate cancer recurrence and your PSA is 0.2. So ordinarily, I think pre PSA days, pre PSMA pet days, you would either just do nothing and wait and observe. You're totally well, you don't have any symptoms. And when your PSA gets to a slightly higher level, you know, you might choose to give radiation to the prostate bed. Uh, but beyond that, if you're well, you'd probably wait a little bit longer and just observe. Whereas now, if you have a PET scan, you see where the disease is. And it could be in a tiny, let's say a two millimeter lymph node in the pelvis. And then there can be a desire to want to cut that lymph node out or give it stereotactic radiotherapy to get rid of it in the hope that we can cure you. Yeah, but what we've seen is that, you know, we really cure men in this setting and uh, we just need to be mindful of that, that we can be then doing treatments such as cutting out a lymph node, but then six months later, there's just disease at another site. So in fact, finding it six months earlier and cutting it out didn't achieve any good in the greater scheme because you just were going to progress anyway and you may actually cause some harm with those interventions. So this is the challenge of this new technology and finding very small volume. The scan is incredibly accurate, uh, but we just need to be mindful not to attack everything we see on the scan. Uh, I think it's helpful to know. I don't think it's useful to be treating people blindly. It's really useful to know, but I think it's good for people to pause. And this is both the doctors that are now getting these scans and don't quite know what to do with them because they haven't had these unbelievable accurate scans before, but also for, for patients to sometimes get these scan results and go, yes, that's very helpful, but it doesn't mean we need to do something about it. There's room maybe for doing nothing, watching and waiting and uh, seeing how things evolve, evolve and then making a, a more informed decision. Really good. And Michael, while we're on that topic, I'm going to skip down to Ross Handley, who's asked a couple of questions. Uh, one is about how many false positives do these things give? Because we've shown these lovely pictures of when it's exactly right. But a question yeah. is, if a thing lights up, how often is that wrong? How many false positives? And he gives his own personal example in another question saying um, he had um, a, a, a treatment or he had a diagnosis of prostate cancer um, and then a PET scan showed a large metastasis in a rib. Um, but the CT scan said, no, that's not real. It's, it's damage from an old thing. Yeah. Can you comment, please, on, on these false positives and maybe especially uh, the ribs? Because we know a lot about that. Yeah, look, this is a good, good area for discussion. I mean, the first thing is uh, no test is perfect. Uh, PSMA PET scanning is it's better than CT and bone scanning and I think uh, MRI in many, in many ways, but it's not perfect. So we do get false positive results. So that's a scan where the you know, something's lighting up on the scan and it looks like a site of cancer spread, but if you stick a needle in it or you follow it up, it turns out not to be cancer. Look, in our experience, in our high volume specialist care at Peter Mac, it's quite rare to get false positive results with PSMA PET. It's actually a very specific uh, scan, but this is a new scan and, you know, there, it is available in 50 centres around Australia and not everyone is so experienced at reporting them. You know, Declan and I have seen many thousands of PSMA PET scans now, but if this is a test that you've just adopted and this is the first few that you've read, you may not just be completely switched on and how to read them. And, and we do see men who come with PSMA PET scans done in a variety of centers and we review them in our multidisciplinary meetings and we disagree with the findings of how someone else has looked at these scans. Uh, so you do need expertise. And the analogy I give Declan is you, you know, you don't go to your general surgeon to have your prostate taken out. And I actually think this is a, a specialized area. And in some places, you know, your radiologist is reporting everything from a stroke scan to breast cancer, to your knee arthritis, to a PSMA PET scan. And I actually think that can be a little bit dangerous. You do want your PSMA PET scan reviewed and reported by someone who's got a specialty interest in sort of cancer imaging or prostate cancer. So the example you give of a rib, uh, I think is a particular area where we see these false positives, but in our hands, they're not false positives because we're often looking at these scans going, 
yep, it's in a rib, we think it's benign. Uh, so I think the key then is, you know, how do you get around that? I think if you're, if your specialist is a member of one of these multidisciplinary meetings where your images are getting reviewed by a, a larger team, having a, a second look, then that can help you. Uh, and if there's any doubt, you know, it's always good to get a second opinion rather than, than making a mistake. Yeah, and second opinions is something we recommend to all our patients with prostate cancer. Most of our patients are second opinions, but of those men we newly diagnose, I, I always encourage them to go and get a second opinion. There's never a rush, and it always helps to feel better informed. Um, I'll go back to the top. Ross Campbell asks the question, uh, what does castrate resistant actually mean? Yes, apologies, Ross, we throw that term in there. So I'll summarize that briefly. So in men who have cancer that has spread beyond the prostate, uh, so essentially that means it's not curable, but it's certainly controllable. Uh, the main way we control those cancers is using androgen deprivation therapy or hormone therapy as, as it's sometimes called. But effectively that leads to this terrible word called castration, because effectively these injections, the hormone therapy we use, takes away testosterone. So it is like literally losing the testicles. Uh, and it does very well uh, in the vast majority of men, often for quite a while, to control that cancer. But then inevitably the cancer is still there and it will become resistant to the hormone therapy or the androgen deprivation therapy. And that's when prostate cancer really takes off and can become very challenging. And those examples Michael shows us are of this castration resistant prostate cancer, uh, CRPC. So it, it means that you've taken a cancer that was already incurable, advanced, but controllable. We control it for quite a while and then it becomes uh, resistant. And there are some other questions on this topic, which I'll come to in a second as well. Michael, we have a, a question from an anonymous person here, but a very specific question talking about, I think referring to those beautiful scans you showed of a man who'd had a, a PSMA PET and an FDG PET, and there were different appearances, the liver had FDG and, and so on. Um, in these circumstances, when you get different appearances, would there still be a benefit in using lutetium to lower the tumor load uh, is the question. Because in our, all our trials, we specifically don't offer lutetium to those types of patients who we know uh, it's not going to respond. Um, but what about if you treated the rest of it? Uh, would that help, I suppose, is the question. Yeah, look, it's a good question. Uh, I think since this is a new type of treatment and you know it's of limited availability, it's not cheap, it is a you know, expensive therapy. We want to use it in people who are most likely to benefit. And uh, if we can't target all the disease, then the beautiful thing is we can predict up front that you're not going to do exceptionally well with this therapy. Uh, now, you allude to, could we, are, in fact, unfortunately, we're not going to target the aggressive disease. In fact, we can predict with this combination when the disease is lighting up on the sugar PET scan and not lighting up on the, F, on the PSMA scans, the sites of tumors that we can't target are in fact the most aggressive. And that's our experience is that these men don't do well. Whatever you treat them with, unfortunately, outcomes are really bad. Now we are trying to look at ways to improve outcomes in, in that group of men, uh, but in our experience, they do poorly. Uh, however, there still may be a role, for example, and I think it should be directed towards symptoms. So if you've got severe back pain, as an example, because of spread of your tumor to bone, and yet you have some sites of disease in lymph nodes that we can't target, then lutetium PSMA as a palliative treatment maybe a very, very good treatment for relieving you of your bone pain, which is what we're trying to do, even if we can't uh, prolong life. So I think there certainly is a role, uh, but it's not where the key role of the treatment is. And the wonderful thing about this theranostic approach is our ability to see what we treat. Uh, so uh, being able to really personalize care is a good thing. And you know, when I see men who have been worked up and aren't suitable and they're disappointed, I do try to sell the positives, which is that if we just treated you, you're going to embark on yet another line of therapy and most likely you're not going to respond to that. At least we can tell upfront that you're not likely to do exceptionally well. And that opens the option, well, what else is available? And, you know, there may be other clinical trials or even sometimes some chemotherapies that are going to be more effective. And I think redirecting to a treatment that's more likely to be beneficial or sometimes to say, unfortunately, you know, we don't have anything. And then at least you can enjoy your remaining period of life rather than coming to hospitals to have futile therapies that 
do have side effects is a better approach. And Rob Phillips uh, asks a similar question, which is, so the lutetium PSMA is life extending, uh, but not a cure. And that is certainly true when we use it in the group of men who have progressed after chemotherapy or even after enzalutamide or abiraterone. You know, I have not cured anyone. We have, do have some men like the one I showed you who's having great responses and we continue to treat with lutetium. And even four years later, uh, you can be well without any symptoms. So sometimes we can change it into a chronic disease uh, with many years of really good quality of life without any symptoms. Uh, but it's certainly not a cure. I can tell you out of the 50 men in our initial trial that started in 2015, there are no men who you know, did not recur. So in every single one of those 50 men, PSA eventually started rising again. Uh, but as we bring this treatment earlier and earlier, I, I do have a glimmer of hope that if we use it very early on as a first line therapy, it's possible that it could be a curative treatment. So this would be, for example, using it instead of external beam radiation. And we know that external beam can cure men with high risk localized prostate cancer. So it's possible that lutetium PSMA could cure men in that state. Uh, I don't think it should be used in that state. That's, you know, we have, we have existing therapies that are kind of uh, not only approved, but, you know, really well understood. And that's a prostatectomy or external beam radiation. Uh, but I think there is a role for doing some clinical trials to see what we can achieve with lutetium PSMA in this setting and study it really carefully. Yeah, and I suppose, as you mentioned earlier, Michael, in bringing it forward, um, Rob, uh, uh, we, are, we have a trial open where we're giving lutetium to patients before a prostatectomy. Uh, and in fact, one of the prostatectomies I did just yesterday was, uh, was one of those patients. So this is someone with cancer confined to the prostate with a big, obvious looking thing on PSMA. And we're wondering whether if we give that patient lutetium once or twice before surgery, will it improve the, uh, the likelihood um, uh, uh, of them doing well in the longer term? Will it decrease the recurrence rate or would it even knock out the cancer completely? And that's the lutectomy study. So that's a big leap forward. And, and as I said, uh, yeah, one of the prostatectomies I did this week is, is one of those patients. So don't know, mightn't work out, but um, uh, we'll, we won't uh, prejudge our results. It is very interesting. Um, we're yeah, over time. To... I'm just going uh, to Sorry, but John... I'm sure we can stay going, can't we? Yeah. John Booz... Booz... Boom Booz... Booz... Yeah, hello, John. Yeah. If you had ADT and docetaxel and need further treatment, would you try abiraterone or go straight to lutetium PSMA? So I think this is a this is a good question. You know, we can't provide individual specific advice on on a on a webinar forum like this. But I you know I think I can answer that question. There's a lot. There's a huge amount of enthusiasm for lutetium PSMA because you know of the nice things about it, the ability to image it. Uh, some men who have had this treatment, the sort of exceptional pictures that I can show you. But we should bear in mind that it is still an experimental therapy. It's not approved in any country in the world, pretty much. Uh, it's not reimbursed anywhere. Uh, we're, still, we're still learning. And uh, the results of these large clinical trials like uh, therapy and vision have still not yet even been published. We only just presented the results of the therapy trial a few weeks ago uh, at that oncology meeting. So using lutetium PSMA instead of something like abiraterone or enzalutamide, honestly, is not something I would advise uh, because enzalutamide and abiraterone are proven life prolonging therapies that are actually really well tolerated and also reimbursed. So to sort of be, you know, there is no, if you're outside of a clinical trial, which I think might be your context to be shelling out $10,000 per cycle of treatment for an experimental treatment, uh, which may be worse than abiraterone, honestly, uh, is not in your best interest. So I think, you know, it could be that in the future, you, it, it, it may enter that space, but I only think it should be done to replace currently approved and proven treatments in a clinical trial. Uh, otherwise, you know, when there's proven therapies, you should go for those first. And Ian Seddon has shared with us his story, um, Michael, of uh, castration-resistant prostate cancer progressive. Ian, sorry to hear all this treatment you've been going through. 
Um, and now he's gone through um, uh, chemotherapy and enzalutamide and, and still this cancer is being a bit feisty by the look of it. And look, that, that's the sort of group that I suppose lutetium has been best studied in. And we would say to you, clinical trials, and there are many available in many centers, many of which involve lutetium will be uh, the best answer there, again, without knowing uh, very specific details. I'm conscious we're over time, Jim. Shall we try and beat through these last few questions? And we did promise uh, Richard Miller we'd let him ask his question in a moment. And um, Max Leslie, is this treatment available in Victoria? Well, only in clinical trials, really, I think Michael would say. Um, although the prostate cancer, uh, the prostate center of excellence may allow some compassionate access in the future. But the answer is yes, but really clinical trials uh, is only where it is at the moment. And um, John again, booms my hello. John asks, why is there such variation in the effectiveness? I suppose, as Michael has shown you, these tend to be patients who've got very progressive cancer. They've already gone through a few lines of treatment, and those cancers do become uh, very heterogeneous, very um, uh, poorly responding to various treatments. So therefore, you expect some different responses. Some patients will uh, um, acquire a DNA repair defect, like BRCA2 and so on, and might, may need a, a different uh, strategy. Um, John, David, uh, John, you have a question. Uh, you give an example of a patient who's had um, a prostate cancer, newly diagnosed, uh, confined to the prostate, but Gleason 4 plus 3, so exactly like the pro-PSMA patients, the ones that have a higher risk of recurrence, um, PSA above 25. So we can put that data into nomograms. We do for all of our patients. And within the nomograms, which are prediction tools, we can say uh, what the likelihood is of a recurrence um, at one year and five years following surgery or following radiotherapy. Uh, and you can actually plug your own data into the nomograms on the Memorial Sloan Kettering website uh, in New York, and you'll get a rough answer back. Um, so these are blunt instruments. You know, every patient's a bit different, but we can give some predictions of the answer uh, to your question. Um, and John, we've answered your question, I think, about um, options for castration-resistant prostate cancer. Uh, Michael, Rob is also wondering, um, uh, can you get into upfront PSMA trial at uh, Calvary uh, Matter, uh, the new upfront PSMA trial? Yeah, so upfront PSMA trial is, uh, look, we are hoping to open it at Calvary Mater, but as of today, it is, it is not open at Calvary Mater. So St. Vincent's in Sydney and Liverpool and also Royal North Shore are other sites in the, in the Sydney area. Uh, so we're hopeful to get Calvary Mater, Newcastle on board. Uh, but last I heard, they were actually having some uh, difficulties activating with their clinical trials uh, resources which was actually disappointing me a little bit because they were involved in the therapy trial uh, so hopefully they will be on board but at the moment you would need to uh, probably drive down to Sydney. There's another question about whether the lutetium PSMA is available in Queensland from Richard Miller. Well uh, a therapy trial and is was run at Royal Brisbane and Women's uh, as will be Upfront and NZP. Uh, and uh, I think there are also a, there is a private uh, provider of uh, lutetium in the private sector fee for service outside of clinical trials context that, that makes lutetium PSMA available as well. Uh, thank you, Michael. Richard, hopefully that might do you, but if you would like us to drag you on, I'm, I'm late for another meeting I need to dial into, I'm afraid, so I'm gonna have to go in a moment um, anyway. Um, but if we can answer more questions, please type it in. Uh, lastly, then, uh, Glenn and uh, Kevin and uh, uh, Glenn Braithwaite, Michael, are we looking for other antibodies for lutetium PSMA or I suppose in the field of theranostics, mm. is it all about lutetium or are there other exciting things that will yeah, be explored? Absolutely. So there's both newer targets, so newer generation PSMA uh, molecules, and we can also use different radioactive substances. One that some people on the line may have heard of is actinium, which is an alpha emitter rather than a beta emitter. Alpha emission is a... Uh, type of radiation that actually has about a thousand fold the uh, intensity or killing power of lutetium. Uh, so there's immense interest in actinium. Uh, but the fact that it's a thousand times more killing power also means that it can be quite uh, dangerous. Uh, so we think actinium should only be used in a uh, clinical trial and uh, it certainly needs some further work, but there's immense interest both in next generation PSMA molecules and different radioactive targets. 
sounds well, a bit worrying, Michael, when the nuclear yeah. medicine physician is saying it's dangerous and it's a thousand times more powerful. I think I'll stick with the lower dose thing. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, and finally, Kevin Downey. Hello, Kevin. It's nice to see all friendly names on this list today. Um, is a blood test still the best or the only indicator for further prognosis? Look, PSA is still very valuable. It gets a hard time, doesn't it? It's valuable for men who are just out there wondering, do they have a risk of prostate cancer? It's valuable when we've diagnosed somebody and we're trying to figure out um, how aggressive their cancer is. Um, it's not the only test we use, but it's, it's important. And it's very important uh, for men who've had treatment and we're monitoring them whether it's surgery or radiation uh, when the cancer is confined, or if they're on uh, therapy for more advanced cancers, PSA is very important. It's still not the only one, but I think if you only have to pick one thing out of all the easy things you can access, yeah, PSA is very helpful and very valuable to us. Um, and with that, we've got through uh, all the questions, Michael. Thank you. It's felt like speed dating trying to get through everything there, um, but I'll hand back over to um, Jim. Look, thanks. Thanks, guys. Um, to Michael and Declan, this has just been a fantastic opportunity for the, the support group members. And uh, I, I will point out that this um, video is going to go on our um, online uh, uh, website on the PCFA uh, online community. So um, all those prostate cancer support group leaders can share that with all their uh, uh, supporters and, and uh I think it'll be a, a valuable tool, but look, it's just been a rare opportunity for us to be able to speak directly, you know, listen directly to you guys and to, to answer, ask questions and have them answered. So uh, you've been very generous with your time. As you said, we've gone over the hour, uh, but look, uh, the fact that I think we had about 80 participants online and uh, 70 of those are still online at the moment. So you can see that you've held everyone's interest and it's been so valuable. And really, we just so much appreciate your time and thank you to everyone that's come in online and we hope we can do this uh, again uh, uh, sometime soon.